Okay, well, there you go. Let's do a quick introduction before we uh, get started here with Ginger. So uh, this is the past cloud virtual chapter, and once again, I'm Jason Strait. Um, our presentation tonight is Use Cases and Application Development for Cloud-Based Azure Machine Learning. Uh, our presenter is Ginger Grant. She is a consultant with Pragmatic Works and the SQL Server, actually not SQL Server, a data platform, one second, let me make that go away, uh, a data platform MVP with Microsoft. We do have uh, upcoming webcasts over the next uh, four or five weeks that have already been scheduled out. We've got other um, some Power BI stuff coming up. We've got Azure SQL Database with John Sterrett, a uh, presentation from Tim Radney coming on uh, SQL Database for the production DBA, and from Azure Act Act Active Directory so you can understand how to um, include identity management in your data platform solutions. Uh, the past, the virtual chapter is, uh, or the cloud virtual chapter is part of the PASS uh, organization. And the PASS organization is our parent organization that does run a summit every year in October. Well, every year at the end of the year. This year it's in, in October from the 25th to the 28th in Seattle. Uh, it's, it's really the conference to go for, to for SQL Server and Microsoft Data Technologies. If you do choose to sign up and you need a discount on it or want a discount on it, you can get a discount using VC15CHB6. It uh, gets you a $150 discount on your registration. Uh, this virtual chapter is one of many virtual chapters in the PASS organization. There's chapters dedicated to specific languages, so you can hear uh, presentations delivered in your native tongue. There is presentations that are role focused like DBA fundamentals and there are and, and data science and there are some that are just focused on different aspects of how you want to learn like the Saturday night SQL Server virtual chapter. Coming up over the next few weeks there are quite a few uh, presentations in the other virtual chapters. You know if there's something that you're looking for there is probably a SQL Server I mean there's probably a virtual chapter presentation that is covered at some point. I do encourage you to take a look. You can find all of those at sqlpass.org slash events. If you are interested in helping out more with the SQL Server and data platform community, PASS is always looking for volunteers. And you can sign up as a volunteer through volunteer.sqlpass.org. So with that, that kind of covers the basics. If you are interested in presenting on a cloud topic, that cloud topic can be anything from a full Azure solution to a partial Azure solution, a hybrid solutions, other cloud technologies like Amazon or um, Google. Uh, the, the main thing that we look for here is a, um, a, a direction towards how does that fit in with delivering data solutions. So if you are interested in doing that, please feel free to reach out. And with this, I will actually turn things over to Ginger. Let's give me a chance to make Ginger the uh, presenter. All right, Ginger, it is all for you now. Great. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, I can see it. Great. All right. Well, there's a number of ways to get started with machine learning, and uh, Microsoft says that R is their on-premise solution, and that means Azure Machine Learning is the solution for the cloud and it's got a, a lot of really great functionality. One of the things that um, I've been talking to people about recently is not only is it good for what I'm going to be showing you today, which is an actual um, a machine learning experiment, but it's a great way to deploy any existing R code that you have into an R service. So it's a really functional tool. It's got all the algorithms that are standard in, for use in the industry. And if you don't like those or want any, to use any of those, you can write, write your own in Python or R. So a little bit about me. I blog way too much at Desert Isle SQL. And I blog quite a bit. I'm probably going to have a topic, a, a blog post on, on this since I haven't Log this week yet, and I can be reached at Ginger Grant at DesertIsleSQL.com. So, what can machine learning really do? Well, um, one of the things that it can do is it can drive robots, which is why I have it on the screen. But no, but it's one of the things a lot of uh, people are wondering, like, what do you need that for? Well, one of the things would be for determining likely outcomes. Um, one very well-known story about that is uh, Target. A number of years ago, 
did, did a machine learning algorithm on what it people buy, what women buy when they are um, when they are pregnant, and they determined you know that, that they tend to change their purchases. They buy unscented lotion instead of scented lotion, and they buy more vitamins and and various other things. So they have this algorithm that they that they use to determine that they could figure out if somebody was pregnant based on what they were buying. And very um, famously, they started sending baby coupons to a um, underage high school girl in Minneapolis, and her father was irate, and came in and said, "Well, what are you doing that for?" And um, they, the manager, apologized because he had no idea what machine learning was doing in the background. But he called him back later because he felt bad that this man had been sent Target coupons for his underage uh, high school daughter. That for, um, indicating that she was pregnant, and the father admitted that actually he had talked to his daughter, and that Target was right. So he knew Target knew before he did that his daughter was expecting. So that's the kind of thing. It's the non-obvious relationship, you know, the relationship between things like scented lotion and pregnancy. Um, another thing that you can do with machine learning is prove unsubstantiated beliefs. Recently, I did a some work for a company that sold insurance on Amazon. And they um, thought that if they had a higher rating, that the um, sales of their product would go up. And they just assumed that that was absolutely true, that there was no reason that that wasn't the case. Well, after doing the analysis on it, I determined that rating really didn't have anything to do with it. Because most people don't, don't specifically look for insurance on Amazon, they just kind of get it after the fact if they buy an iPhone for their kid or something. It didn't. It wasn't that um, an indicating factor at all, and they were very happy about that because they moved some resources around, and so basically they had somebody that was making a decent salary that was working on Amazon. And they moved them off to doing something else because uh, machine learning was able to prove that the relationship didn't exist. Um, looking at relationships, that's a commonly a technique called linear regression. And if you can kind of imagine, it's just basically looking at things that relate. Like, I live in Arizona, so given the temperature and uh, going up, the other thing that's going to be going up is my power bowl. Ta-da! Linear regression, two things that correlate. So the other thing that you can do with machine learning is, is identify groups, looking for various groups of people and seeing how they buy things. Um, one big one is, is for customers um, from leaving. That's a one that you hear about all often, um, where they t they talk about you know that they can look at the data and determine that somebody is actually leaving. And the other thing that machine learning can do is identify theft or errors. But one thing that's in common with all these topics is you have to have really good data to make that work. Um, for example, Directv had no idea that I was leaving because I just basically decided one day that I didn't feel like paying with them and I just terminated the service. If there's no data to indicate I've never called them before and I didn't call them before I left. So any kind of analysis that was being done on customer leaving wouldn't have caught me at all. Um, so that's one thing to, to consider is whether or not you actually have the data to do some of the things that you want to do. And that's why I think that people who have a data background are really good at doing machine learning because there's more to this than algorithms. Um, the majority of the time spent with machine learning, believe it or not, is once you've got the algorithms down, is actually finding the data to see if you have the data to support what you do. All right, so what types of things can you do um, with machine learning? Well, there's f um, four major classifications or types of machine learning. Um, one of them is classification, um, probability of certain outcomes. Um, these th are really popular with insurance companies. You know, in the case of a head-on collisions, what's the probability that you're going to have an insurance claim over ten thousand um, dollars? That would be some kind of a, a classification. You know, yes, no, is, is that going to happen? Um, clustering. I've got a picture here of clustering where various groups are identified. Um, recently, I worked on a client that actually paid to have web analysis done on their customer base. And boy, you'd be surprised at things that they can find out about you. Things like, um, are you likely to go on to a vacation where there's water involved? If you voted for the last election, if you own a dog, do you have kids? And some of these factors they can correlate to determine that this people with these classifications or these characteristics, they're more likely to buy 
rental insurance and people who say don't have a dog aren't perhaps. So it's basically looking at, at, at data points and clustering them into groups to see that, that various people with these characteristics move in different ways. Um, regression is looking for patterns. Like I talked before, if I can correlate two things together, you know, then I can determine if one thing's going to happen, another one is quite likely. Um, for example, if it ever cools off, then my air conditioning bill will go down, which would be a wonderful thing. And then one that um, is really common is anomaly detection. This, uh, I'm sure everybody who has a credit card has been called at some point in time by their credit card company because they do things that they're not expecting. Um, I actually worked near the fraud department for one of the largest banks in the U.S. And for a period of time, I do not know if this is still true, but if you change the address of your credit card to Hollywood, they would automatically assume it was a fraud because they had so much fraud going on in Hollywood, Florida. So again, do, does that necess if you move to Hollywood, Florida, does that mean your credit card's bad? No, but they're detecting that that's, the probability that that is the case goes way up. So that's your standard anomaly detection. So what kind of use cases can be used for machine learning using your standard use case diagram there? Forecasting. Forecasting is a very very common thing that's done with machine learning. Um, if you've ever bought stock or thought about buying stock, you'll know that they always have that disclaimer, you know, past performance is not indicative of future response. Well, that may be true, but I can also tell you that there's going to be a big line in Macy's a day after Thanksgiving, and I'm no psychic, but I know when Christmas is. So there's various things that you can determine based on forecasting. But one of the more common things is to look for more obscure trends. This is really, really popular with day traders. Um, they look at when things do, if there is a repeatable peak and valley period. Um, another thing with forecasting is looking at not only the past, but looking at what various variables do to um, determine what's going to be happening next year. For example, if you are in, if you are U-Haul and you are in, Cal and you have trucks in California, given the current um, predictive models, you're probably going to want to put more trucks into California because over the past five years they've determined more people are leaving than coming in. So it's just various things you can see with trends over time, various demographic information that you have available to you. Another very common thing is sentiment analysis. You'll see a lot of machine learning on sentiment analysis. And frankly, I'm not that impressed with the results you've been able to find because from what I see, you know, anecdotally on, on places like Twitter, is that people tend to only mention certain companies if they are just hopping mad and just fit to be tied for whatever the reason is or something amazing happened. Well, that only gives you the extremes. And it's interesting to see how the extremes impact you. Like, for example, um, what United's airplane sales did when a song called United Breaks Guitars went viral and the person who wrote it was on the Today Show. But let's face it, life isn't necessarily about extremes. Life is about the day-to-day -day learning. So sentiment analysis, I'm not sure it's always that valuable. Facebook is a little bit better than Twitter, but still a lot of the data does not indicate that it's the most useful thing ever. Um, customer churn, uh, there's a, a lot, a lot of research being done on that. I will caution anybody who's interested in doing that is to make sure you have the data that's actually going to be helping you. Um, a lot of times also when people leave, they don't tell you. Um, think about it. I mean, if you are if you're decide that you're done with a company for whatever reason, unless they've really hawked you off, you may just say, because I felt like it and leave. So the data may not be available. But fraud is a really big one and, and continues to be used in a lot of different cases just because it can be extremely important and also can, if you can find fraud early, it can be indicative of a lot of things like large-scale identity theft, uh, like happened with, with LinkedIn not too long ago. So fraud is actually one of the ones that I find more fascinating than some of these other ones because what you're doing for fraud is you're looking for the exception. So I want to spend more time talking about um, how we can actually look at machine learning to help us with fraud. So what is fraud? Well, fraud is really finding the exception records. With fraud, you're finding the needle in the haystack. You're not grouping things together. You're looking for the dot that's like way out there. 
You want the exception to every rule. You want to do the opposite of what you do in most machine learning, which is group things together. You want to find things that are way apart. And to do that, use different sampling techniques than you would use um, in, in all the rest of the kinds of machine learning. You want to ignore the majority of the records. And one of the ways you do this is to do this thing called stratified sampling. And what you do with stratified sampling is you look at your sample records that contain your anomaly, and you just look at those separately, because generally speaking, you don't have too many of them. I mean, if you think about credit card transactions, how many of them do you have versus how many do you have that are fraudulent? I mean, the numbers are just way skewed um, in the positive. So by, by excluding and only looking at the ones in error, you can really identify unique characteristics on that and evaluate that criteria separately. All right, so how do you develop a machine learning model? That is, of course, uh, Google's uh, machine learning car, by the way. So the important thing to do is select a, a data subset. One thing that I want to caution people is that the Azure ML user interface is a really good-looking GUI that we will get a, um, a look at here in a little bit, but it's not this throw a million records at it. Matter of fact, if you do more than, mm, I'd say 10,000, you're going to notice it's going to be extremely pokey and slow. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, then why would I use this tool? You hardly put any data in it. Well, the reason why is because the machine learning UI is designed to be where you start. It is not designed to be the end all, be all, I'm done with it because my experiment works model. The idea with Azure Machine Learning is that you would use it to create a trained model. Um, once you have that trained model created, then you would create a web service and that's what you run all the data through. So you do not run all your data through um, through the UI. It's not designed for that. But that does, of course, means that you have to select an appropriate uh, set of data for your sample set because you can really screw your results if you intend to run a terabyte worth of data through it and you limit your selection to 5,000 rows. Um, I can understand that, that is a bit of a, of a quandary, but one thing you can always do when you deploy the web service is this is sort of meant to be an iterative process and so you can create a new web service if you determine that you get wildly different results when you have a real sample set versus the testing sample set that you probably employed with it. Azure Data Factory is the way that um, most web services are deployed if you're looking to do it at scale. Now, if you have a web service, obviously you can be call it with anything. Um, one of the things that's included in Azure Machine Learning is the ability to create a little test data set so that you can do it in Excel. But let's face it, you're not going to be deploying, at least I hope not, a, a production-ready um, Azure Machine Learning experiment to Excel, hopefully you've got some, um, hopefully you're looking at a larger sample set of data and that would, uh, generally speaking, either Azure Machine Learning or perhaps you've got your own web app that you've got or some other code and application where you plan on putting the data through it. It doesn't really matter, but what it is designed to do is be a component. Um, maybe later on I could do a session on Azure Data Factory because like I said, I can't possibly do it at the same time. But how to make this work is, is what, you, what Azure does I'll show you a picture here, is it um, has several components that you need to create to make it work. Um, I didn't put it on here, but you of course need to have a, a to um, um, create a resource group initially, and that's where all this stuff, all stuff lives, and I didn't want to discount that, you know, although it's not on the slide, this is actually Microsoft's graphic. But once you have a um, resource created, then you need to um, create a create a link service. You know, tell it where where are you going to connect to? Where's your data coming from? Your data could literally come be coming from anywhere. You could put your your data could be coming from on premise. Your data could be coming from a blob, SQL data, database, Azure database, anywhere you like. You basically have to, to tell it, okay, this is my link service. This is where my data is coming from. Next step is to actually um, get a data set together, either a query or um, a set of data that you will act, be accessing through that link service. Um, then you will need to create um, an activity. What are you doing? What are you? Um, what what kinds of things are you doing? And then you will create a pipeline. A pipeline will kind of encapsulates all of this. A pipeline is actually your um, your management. A pipeline you would you would 
include things like when is it going to run, what kind of notification is going to be received. All of that great information comes through creating a pipeline. So this, I know a lot of people think of Data Factory as kind of like SSIS in the cloud. Well, sort of, but it's more like a SQL job because you have a job, you have inputs, you have outputs, and then you have the history of the job, and you also have you know notification if it's running. So it's actually a little bit more like a job than it is an SSIS package. So this is where you would invoke, invoke the um, Azure ML web service using the batch execution activity, and you can um, put as much data through it as you wish. Uh, I know that the, the Microsoft has a customer that literally puts a ter over a terabyte of data through it whenever they run it. Um, you can also stream this data. It does not have to be from a source. You can use an IoT. Um, you can use IoT with it as well. All right, well, enough talk. Let's actually take a look at doing some machine learning at this point. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up about Azure Machine Learning, and I'm going to go out to the beginning here, like I am anyway, is that unlike every single other Azure service that you probably feel like playing with, this is really free. And while, um, believe you me, Microsoft will sell you um, a the standard version so that you'll be able to um, to use huge amounts of data through it, you don't need it. I have done all the work that I have done, and until I've been deploying it, I've done it all on free stuff. So this will cost you absolutely nothing, which is why it is the best Azure tool to get started with, because all the rest of them will cost you money, and this one will not. All that you need to do is create a account at studio at azureml.net, and then um, you'll need to have a Microsoft ID to be able to do that. You can use lots of them, just saying. And then you have in a place that you can run your experiments. And I'm going to go into my experiments. Well, experiments is basically program in Azure ML speak, if you haven't played with it before. And Azure ML is like all Azure services. I know when you're giving a demo, and that's when it decides to be as slow as anything. So a little bit of UI, unfortunately, um, all the colors they like are blue and gray, so that's the only color you see, which is unfortunate, and I have already whined about that to the product manager, and he said that he didn't have any control over that. That was all the graphics people. But um, it looks, if you look at the, each experiment, you'll see that it has a little picture um, that's next to it to kind of give you an idea of how to organize it up. Um, Microsoft, this is almost as good as Power BI when it comes to updates, and there's been a number of updates. My favorite one this week is, and I will show you that one, is that you have the ability to do a partial run of an, of an Azure machine learning experiment, which is just awesome. You can also, this came up last month where you can actually create projects that, would, that contain um, several, pro, several experiments together so you can sort of start grouping things instead of having this giant mess that I have here. But, this is what I've got. So what I'm going to do with my experiment now is I want to go ahead and take a look at um, doing an experiment, create a new experiment. And this experiment is going to be on loan underwriting. And what we want to look at is we want to look at all the people that we've given loans to who did not pay their loan back as we expected to and what their algorithms were. So all these people got approved, but over time, some of them turned out to be bad credit risks. And this data is taken from a common data set that is um, from UCI Irvine. UCI Irvine has got a great place where they have lots of sample data, which is good because customers won't let me show the data that I'm working on. So one of the things that you can do with Azure Machine Learning is you have the ability to create your own data sets and or use some sample ones, and I'm, and I'm going to be doing both. Now, you also can import data from a, uh, a SQL database. Uh, I generally don't. I generally use CSVs for testing because I find it easier to do than using a um, Azure Machine Learning Service. Unfortunately, in the UI, you cannot connect to any on-premises data. You can only connect to web-based data, which is why if, you've, if you know eventually that you are going to want to use it, um, and you've got on-premises data, just create a sample set with, with a CSV and, and, and pull that up there. So let's go ahead and create a new experiment to do anomaly detection for 
finding out who are our deadbeats. One thing that's really cool about um, machine learning is there's a lot of samples that they have. So if you want to know how something works and you actually want to see something works and you want to spend about five seconds doing it, if you click on any of these examples and run it, you'll see it run and you can take a look at actual working code, which is a really kind of a neat thing. But we're going to go ahead and start off with a blank experiment. Come on. And this it, um, gives you the little UI that we're talking about, and it's got a number of items here on the left menu, which contains everything that you would that you need to do for um, Azure Machine Learning. You'll see there's a lot of menu items here. I generally forget what's in here, and I'll show you why. Because generally speaking, I just use this search thing, which is awesome. So one of the things that we're going to do to start is that we're going to start by giving this some data. So we're going to look at some of the sample data sets. And the sample data set that I'm interested in is, is the um, German credit card, which is not, which is our um, banking evaluation data. And one thing that we can do is I'm going to go ahead and give this a real name. So I'm going to go ahead and say save as cloud demo because saving things is a good idea. And you see it changes the name up here as well. And it says it can't expand with no modules. That's awesome. All right, so let's take a look at this data. And we can look at it by clicking on the little dots at the bottom and go ahead and say visualize. And what we can see here is this is a visual representation of our data. And if we click on something, we can see that these are the values that are in this particular column. Unfortunately, because the way this data came over, there are no headers. So I can't tell you what this is, and I find that really annoying. Um, there are a number of ways that I can fix this. Um, because I know SQL, I'm going to use the, uh, to fix it with SQL Server um, using, using some SQL. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to, do, what I want to do is if I have this data is I have created some header information. Um, so I just have my header information here, and if we look at this, we can see that this contains names and absolutely nothing else. So I'm going to go ahead and use my names and my um, credit card information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some SQL. And notice as I'm typing, my list is getting shorter. And this is why I do not remember where all the items are on the list, because I just type what I need and it pops up for me. So what I want to do is I want to apply a SQL transformation. And I'm going to go ahead and I want to use these two data sets for my SQL command. Now what it does here is you'll notice is that it gives these two data sets the names of T1 and this one is T2. Um, you cannot rename them and this one is 1 and this one is 2 and you can see you can have 3. So that's your rule set. And you can run, um, any, they call this SQL light, um, but it is pretty much ANSI SQL. You can't write CTEs in here, but your standard SQL commands all work fine. So what I want to do is I want to do a union all so that I can get my headers appended to my data so that I can actually see what I've got. And yes, I do require that you put a semicolon at the end of it. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. which is done by the run command, very easy. And that's the, what's deceptively simple about this. It's very powerful, but it also looks really Mickey Mouse. So if we take a look at the results here and visualize them, and we can see we have names now, yay! So we can see we've got whether or not somebody has a bank account, and there's various codes for um, what kind of a bank account they have what kind of rating they have for our bank accounts. Is it a, um, what, what values do they have for this? Um, you'll also notice that this is considered a string feature. And so as it's considered a string feature, these things aren't in real order because it's looking at it as a string. There are the categories of people's credit history, categories of the type of loan, so types of loan credit, what kind of savings that they have, their employment score, Demographics, um, and it, these codes indicate whether somebody is married, divorced, has children. Um, if they have other debtors, oh, this is interesting, years at residence. Um, this is a histogram. This isn't necessarily only counting people one through four. They've just categorized everybody. And this one's fun, age. 
What I find interesting is how um, the fact they only have they have 53 unique values, so it gives you an idea of their their data set there. Um, the type of phone that they have, and since this is from Germany, when, whether or not they are a foreign worker, and I looked this up, this is no. And then we have the rating, and so this is how they ended up being rated. Um, and a lot, this is actually better than a lot of anomaly detection. I'm working on some anomalies right now, and I can't disclose what kind of anomalies that we are dealing with, but the data sets we've got is out of like 20,000, we'll have three. Um, this is a little bit different. We're looking at out of 1,000 elements, we have 30 of them that are considered anomalous or bad. So this is actually a much easier data set to work with. So what we want to do is we want to look at what kind of factors determine whether or not this loan is going to go bad, which is two is the loan going bad. So it looks like they've got like a third of their loans going bad since there's a thousand records here. And one of the things that I think this is a really great thing is I wish I have always had this ability to look at data because it's a great way of just seeing really briefly what you've got, you know, number of dependents. Again, these are groups that don't just have two dependents. So just kind of a, kind of a neat thing to have. All right, so what we're going to do to analyze our loans is we're going to actually look at, the first thing we want to do is create a label. And a label is basically indicating what are the variable that is our outcome variable. So our outcome variable is one or two, and two indicates that the loan's gone bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change, is I need to classify that one. And so what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to take that one variable, and I'm going to indicate that it's a label. And that variable is the last one, which is rating. So I'm going to select rating. And I'm going to say that I want rating to be a, um, to be a label. And this tells me that this is my value record. So now that I've got a value record, what the standard thing is to do with machine learning is to look at your data and test some of it against your algorithm and then do um, look at the other portions of your data as not as non-test and see if you're, what you what you think will happen matches what actually happens. So to do that we are going to split this. And to split this, again using my I can't remember where these are way to find things. I'm just going to type split. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and split my data. You'll notice that I've got a green check here because this ran. No green checks here. Obviously, this didn't run, and this is data that doesn't have green checks. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go ahead and split my data. Well, um, it's one of the things that it defaults to is 50-50. I don't want 50-50. I want to do 75%, um, which is, statistically speaking, a much better way of doing it. Um, now, what I do want to do, though, is I want to do a stratified split. And the reason that I want to do a stratified split is because I've got a lot of, I'm trying to find outliers. And when I'm looking to find outliers, I want to make sure that I have my um, ones and twos. I actually am going to have some. So I'm going to go ahead and say that I want this to be true. And it's going to ask me, what, I, what, are, what is the variable that I care about here? And so what I care about is rating. And notice it tells me, select a single column. So that's what it's going to split on, is rating. All right, so if we go and look at the various ways that is out of the box that we can look at anomaly. First, we have to figure out a spell. Um, looking at anomaly detection. Actually, I'm going to look at some of these models here. Uh, I'll show all of the models here, actually, so that we can take a look at them. I'm going to go ahead and close this. We can see the ways that out of the box um, Azure ML has for looking at anomaly detection. So if we keep on looking down here at machine learning, we'll see there's a number of different types of evaluations. You try to find things that are correlative, clustering. Um, is where you look for groups and the groups of items. And classifying is looking at various decisions and seeing what the probability, so it's really a probability classification. And what we're doing is anomaly detection. We'll notice that there are two different 
possible algorithms that we could use for anomaly detection. The question is, which one works better? Well, to be honest, don't really know. So let's do both of them. So we have one class support vector, and the other one is PC-based anomaly. So you can see I'm just dragging these on the screen. And this is what I'm going to want to, these are the algorithms that I'm going to want to use. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to go ahead and I want to train my model using these two different um, algorithms. So I'm going to go ahead and just get lazy again and say that I want to train my model. And I have two models, so I need two things to train them with. And it's telling me right off the bat the error, and my error is that I don't have anything connected to it. So I want to obviously um, add my algorithm, and then I want to add my data. And then once I've got my, um, did I do this backwards? I think I did. Oh, I know why it's I know why it's mad. There we go. All right, but it's giving me an error and it's telling me that the value is required. So what it's telling me is it doesn't know what I'm interested in. So it wants to know what column that I'm interested in evaluating. Again, that is rating. And of course, I have to do it on both of them. Oops, but only once. All right, so even though I'm not running it, this is kind of its IntelliSense. So then after this, what I want to do is I'm going to want to evaluate the model. I'll actually want to score it. And I'm going to score it, again, taking my data from my split data and putting it here. And then I'm going to score it here, let's score this one, and I want to go ahead and do, actually what I want to do on this one, I want to go ahead and do that from here, and then I'm going to want to evaluate to figure out which one is best. And I can tell you that this is a very simple model. And like many simple things, this is probably not going to give us the results that we're looking for. Um, the reason being is that we're doing anomaly detection, and this is a rather simplistic way of doing it. And you know what? I did this wrong. I want to make sure that both of these come from here. And this comes from here as well. So I've got my the training from the same set of splits and my scoring on the same set of splits. That's why I wanted to go ahead and do it that way. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And oops, I can just make things bigger or smaller by zooming in and out here. And this week, actually, on I think it was Monday, Microsoft added the ability for me to do highlight things and then say run selected which is the best thing ever. So it doesn't have to necessarily run the entire model, just the bit that I haven't, that I want it to run. So it's going ahead and running. And this does vary. I will say that actually doing this at night is pretty cool because the variability changes a lot less if you do this during the day it can change this is one of the differences between free and pay free has got a lot more variability than pay does but hey you know you get what you pay for right so it's telling me that it's done so let's go ahead and evaluate this and I'm gonna go ahead doing like I evaluated everything clicking on visualize so what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing what's called a um, a ROC curve, and that is also called a receipts, sorry about that, receiver um, characteristic curve. And what this does is it tells me the prob um, how good my model is. 
Well, unfortunately, my model's terrible. The reason why is this line here indicates a 50-50 chance of my results being accurate. And although this line, this gray line is kind of hard to see, you can see that my model on the right, which is the one that's blue, is basically no better than a coin toss. You got to, half the time it's going to be right and half the time it's going to be wrong. Um, a lot of times this is real. Sometimes our data does not um, permit itself to showing anything that's absolutely of any value. Um, so if you get this situation and you've got two options, give it up because you don't have data or tweak your algorithm some more. Um, another thing that's, that uh, people also look at is look at these numbers here and this is actually called a confusion matrix. Great name, right? And if you look at here at the true positives, you'll see that um, I guessed all of the true positives true, um, but I didn't guess any of the negatives right. So this isn't a very, but I got all the false positives right. So I didn't get a very good score. I'm not terribly accurate, but I, and I didn't, I didn't really find any, neg I didn't get false negatives, I didn't get true negatives, so it's, it's kind of a very weird sort of score. And it, it gives me the, um, positive examples and some more conditions about my model. But this model isn't very good. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because this is a lot of times with machine learning, it's easy, but it's um, there are additional steps that you need to take if you're doing something that's a little bit more complicated like this is. And in the interest of time, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to do the Julia Child method and I'm going to show you how I fix this. So how I fix this experiment is I added some more splits. All right, one of the things that's great about uh, Azure Machine Learning is it'll give you a little mini map so you can see things and it'll also position Zoom to fit for me. So what we can see here is I've got my same um, header information. I'm going to zoom in now so you can actually see this. And everything's the same up to here, but you'll notice that in order to fix this, I got a lot more splits going on. So what do I have here? Well, what we can see here is I've got my stratified split here, and then also over here, what I'm doing is I have also a stratified split, but this split that I'm doing later on, this is looking at regular expression. So this is grouping my data into two buckets, one where I'm only looking at the one value and one where I'm looking at the two values, so I'm separating things out, the, um, and I do that here as well. Next thing that I'm doing is I'm tuning the model hyperparameters. So what is that about? What that's doing is that I'm looking at all of the variables and I'm looking at a metric score to see if what I can do to make them more accurate. And what I'm looking for is errors because with anomaly detection I am looking for errors. So I'm doing my model tuning on both of these. Again, I have the same algorithms, a one class support vector over here and my PC-based anomaly detection here. So when I'm running this, I again get down to my evaluate model. I'm going to go ahead and visualize that. And you'll notice that with the modifications that I made to the model, although it's the same data, I've greatly improved um, both. Um, what this area here is called is the area under the rock, and you want as high as possible. Now, ideally, if this was a um, unreal training experiment, it would be kind of like a perfect golf game. It would, it would be all the way up here because you were perfectly guessed everything every single time. But let's face it, nobody plays 18 holes of golf only hitting the ball 18 times, and generally speaking, your data, this is a more realistic um, goal to have. You'll notice that my accuracy here is 7%. I do have some true positives, some false negatives, some true negatives, so it's a much more indicative model of something that would actually be run. So one of the things with machine learning is now that I've trained it, I can go ahead and create a web service. And I'm going to zoom out because this is actually kind of a neat thing to do. And I want you to see it. All right, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that I wanted to retrain this as a web service. And when it does that, look, it automatically starts moving little boxes for me and telling me what my inputs and outputs are. And it tells me that these are my inputs and these are my outputs. And it tells me how my, asks me about my data flows. 
and then I can compare it. And then it tells me that it's adding these web input and output nodes. And then it tells me, asks me if I want to run the experiment again. Now, one of the things that I would probably do if I was doing this for real is that I would pick the best experiment, best algorithm, not do both of them, but I would stick with a one-class um, support vector because my evaluation was a little bit better. And, but I'm going to go ahead and say run and run all of this, and then it will create my web service for me. So if you're looking to see how hard it is to create a web service, um, you just saw it. It's not terribly difficult at all, which is why this is a great method of deploying it, and now that I've got a web service, I can use it to call things while it is busy running this. Um, I can publish it to gallery. I never do because that leaves it open to the world, and I just generally don't do that. And my completed um, trained models are listed here. And um, my web services are listed here. So this is where I can go ahead and call my web services that I create. And I can go back and look at my experiment and see why well, it's still running because I think it's being slow. Oh, now it says it's finished. Come on. All right, so now I can go ahead and set up my web, um, set up my web service and go ahead and deploy it. And that's it. Now I have a deployable web service that I can call. And what this is doing is you will need to pass this API key in when you do this. Um, if you want to do back to execution, which we will be what we would deploy to Data Factory, it will to give you all the information that you need to how to, to how to do this. Request headers, response code, and everything that you need to make that happen. All of this is pre-done for you. And you can go ahead and test it as well. And it gives you the, the data to predict. Now I do need to move this around so it actually has a header information, which is something that I failed to do, but that's on me for making sure that this is right. If I entered all the values in here, appropriately predict based on those values if somebody was was um, going to default on their loan. All right. So a little bit about testing. Um, we looked at the ROC curves. Um, the area under the curve is a bit of, uh, above the, below above the diagonal line and to see how big that gap is between that and the, and the line that gets drawn, that's your um, area under the curve, and that what you need to be as high as possible. On the confusion matrix, so we'll show you your true positives and false positives, and that's how you can evaluate it. If you're working at developing a machine learning process, I really think you need to, to understand, learn and understand the data. Um, the data, you need to have a really good understanding of if you have the data to even do what you're looking to do. Um, your data also must be clean. You cannot um, um, evaluate missing data. So if you have any missing data, then you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. You can, you'll can, you either have to get rid of it or estimate what the actual values of any missing values are because they cannot be computed. Um, you'll want to do what we did. You'll test various algorithms to see which one works best. And by the way, these things change over time. So then you want to look at your models and repeat. And one of the things that you want to be aware of is overfitting. If you run the same data through all the time, it's kind of like memorizing how to study for the test when you have an answer key. After a while, you don't even look at the answers. You just fill in A, B, C because you know that that's the sequence. So if you, you run the same data every single time, the algorithm gets so smart that it no longer evaluated on the data. It's evaluated on when it last ran. So beware of that when you're testing it. So a little bit of summary, we talked about what machine learning ML can do. We talked about some of the use cases for machine learning. Um, we discussed the various types of analysis, clustering, regression, and of course anomaly. Um, and we talked about the development and implementation steps, and we reviewed a Azure ML anomaly experiment and reviewed how we can um, take a look at the results. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions? I do have um, a lot 
lot of posts about Azure ML on my website at desertilsql.com. So if you have if you're interested in more information, I do have some. All right, thanks, Ginger. We actually have no questions in the queue. I think you actually hmm. nailed all the questions this time, and it helps that we had a good internet connection. That's usually what I get questions about. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, really? This has been great. Great. Well, hopefully it's a good introduction, and I would like to come back at some point in time and do Data Factory, which would be step two of this, and, and then show how you can take an Azure ML experiment and then deploy it in Data Factory and actually get some results going through it. It's just kind of a fun thing. I am positive that people yeah. want to do that. So yeah, well, let's all right. Figure out how to get on your schedule. Shouldn't be well, if that's it, we got is it? we got about four minutes left, so I think that's probably about right. Sounds good. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Ginger. Thank you, everyone who uh, attended the the presentation today. This will be up on YouTube shortly, so if anyone wants to revisit any of the sections, you'll be able to do that. And thank you very much, Jason. I really appreciate giving the opportunity to speak at the Cloud Virtual Chapter. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.